Hello everyone. My name is King Wally Otto. I lurk in the This Sporting Life soundproof booth and I love it when Roy and HG get away from the sporting paddock and share their insights into the after hours caper. This being the case, I'm thrilled to be here introducing this magnificent cassette, Tool Talk and Wisecracks. Sure, Roy and HG are widely acknowledged as two of Australia's greatest sporting minds, but their knowledge of the sheet arts is second to none in Asia. Now, I was very familiar with Roy and HG's sporting work, but it was only when I spent a very pleasant midsummer's weekend with Schur and the former Duchess of York that I realised how much Roy and HG had contributed to the horizontal folk dancing caper. The three of us made up a foursome with one of the palace corgis and whiled away the long days on the tool and between dips we shot the breeze. Sure has always been impressed with Roy's zany ideas on underwear. She loves a man who thinks with a lewd gusset and the former Duchess believes HG's knowledge of finger foods and traditional date dishes is world class. These two attractive and forthright international personalities convince me that when the shirts are hurled in the air and the only sound is the sweet clang of the trousers hitting the floor, Roy and HG offer a unique and practical perspective on a tricky subject that can easily turn tacky. Just a few words of warning. Please don't stand while you listen to this cassette, as your embarrassment will cause offence to other loved ones. And if you find the blue burns the ears, then now it's the time to either button your lip and leave, or to slip into the room of mirrors, loosen the togs, hit it with a cold spoon, and have a good, hard look at yourself. Having got that off my chest, I'm going to lie back on the ottoman and let tool talk and wisecracks wash all over me. I suggest you do the same. Roy, the AFL calendars have come out and what a tremendous spread it makes. There's two, I understand, uh, at the moment battling it out on the newsstands. The men of AFL and the men of all seasons. And, uh, gee, Roy, when you see big... <laughs> ...fit Australian men just bearing it all for their code... I must say, uh, North Melbourne's uh, Anthony Rock, with a tattoo on his buttock, comes up an incredibly attractive It customer. is. He's got that, uh, that David Hook's alluring bit of crack look uh, with the jean pulled down very low, sh exposing the, b the top half of the back crack. Uh, where there seems to be a very attractive tattoo of a... looks like a Disney character. It might be uh, Elmer Fudd. Elmer Fudd on his buttock. Well, that's uh, either a statement or a cry for help, isn't it? But uh, Craig Kelly. Craig Kelly looks good, and there's a lot of recurring imagery here, HG, of uh, an orb. This looks like a, a red apple, or is it a what duck? Is it? It's a duck, is it? A oh, he's got a duck covering uh, his love gear. The uh, bed flute is covered by a, a duck, a very small duck too, might I say, Craig Kelly. Uh, no offence, son. And he's and got a lizard on his shoulder. And he's got a ball tucked under his arm. Mm. Interesting symbolism. Oh, I see. You've got dinosaurs behind him. I see. It's with this dinosaur mania Bath that's going course. to hit... Yeah. Jurassic Park Jurassic style. Jurassic Park, Steven Spielberg style. Well, yes, yes. That, well, that's very good. What I like is Hutto from Hawthorne, Mr July, mm. in the Men of AFL. This is the official calendar. Uh, has a pool cue coming up out of the Dax. Yes, he has too. He has to. Well, that's very, very funny. Imagery, and waistcoats have come back in a big way. Yes. Uh, you know, sort of a waistcoat here, Nicky Winmar style, probably a sort of a, a sort of ta Terry Towling waistcoat he's got on. And Hutto's got a, what looks like a, a beautiful corduroy waistcoat. Yeah. And Mark Harvey of Essendon looking fabulous With there in the hammock. Skin. With your leopard skin waistcoat. Yes. Unfortunately, uh, Alex Mr. Lynch. October, that's Nicky Winmar. He's got a basketball covering the, uh, the night tools. Uh, looking very... Um, sultry. Sultry, isn't he? Mm. Uh, mm. He's the only one actually not eyeballing the camera, down the barrel style, which gives him that far away, quasi-heroic, troubled look, doesn't it? But I, I think it's a good thing. Look, anything that uh, gets the players publicity and gets the players out and about known, I, I think that's got to be good for the code. I, I encourage all codes. You know, I'd like to see all players, all registered first-grade players of all codes in Australia, a nude photograph taken of them, or in a sultry, you know, nature shot, and uh, uh, just put out in all papers. 
Well, that you would know be what I mean? free, like starting, free starting to all kiddies. Yeah, starting the beginning of the year. Yes, you might have some. Oh, no, really, I mean, one big, oh, you know, like like a huge. Yes, yeah, so like I, I think Shell used to do this sort of thing with uh, with uh, sh- animals shell, in Australia. No, with shell cards. Yeah, no, you actually, stick diff- them on different shells and different sea marine yeah. life. Yeah. Well, with players, I, I think you get a big. With you know, holes in with it. With holes in it. With an outline around them. Yes. And you'd go along and they'd be fit weight by 10, say, so you've got yep. a good eye, yep. you know, idea of what, how big it was. Yes. Uh, and, uh, you know, you'd go along each week with your petrol. You'd have, obviously have to spend $10 or more, but let's yep. face it, you know, it's very difficult to buy any petrol for $10 these days. That's true. You walk in, you pay your $10, you get a couple of cards. Mm. Then you can swap. Mm. Some would be pretty hard to get, like, let's say, uh, I don't know, Justin Madden was incredibly difficult to get, and they only printed one of Justin or Did two they? of Justin. No, no, this is what I mean. Oh, you know, I so see, so yes. lucky Kitty would be over the moon that he got Justin Madden, Justin Madden and yeah. he could swap him for ten others, you know. For a Renee Kink or something, if, <laughs> if you still play. Yeah, yeah, if you still play. But, uh, you know, and, and two, I'd like to see games as well, actually, like match different bits, like if you had the players' faces or the players' bodies. Oh, this is a good idea. And uh, the players' dates photographed separately, bent over style, and, say, the players' scrotums and glands penis as well. So, So you'd have four cards to match up as to one player. The four cards would be the date, the, the head, head the, the scrot- scrotum and, and the glands <laughs> penis. The flute. Well, wouldn't that involve the kiddies? <laughs> what I'd like to see, though, is a standard shot mm. of everybody touching their toes in the nude mm. with the head grinning at the camera through the legs. So it's then you'd be able to get an idea of which date actually went with which player <laughs> yeah. in yeah. the heads. And then oh, you can have sure. a lot of fun, mm. say, by putting Mark, so Harvey's, Mark Harvey's date yeah, on with... Dermot Burton's head. Yes. Should Dermot ever come back? And mm. stuff like that. Mm. Gee, that would be funny. Mm. Yeah, it would be funny. It would be tasteful. It'd be interesting, it'd be sultry. Scientific. Scientific. And it would get children, in particular kiddies, talking, thinking football. Uh, and that's got to be a... Tra- and there are commercial aspects to it as well. You know, boxes of chocolates in which there are... Cards. Yeah, but they're all date cards. Yeah. So you'd have date chocolate. Mm-hmm. <laughs> Then you'd have wheat bix cereal, you'd have flute wheat bix Flute wheat yeah, uh, scrotum wheat bix And you, so, so, uh, you wash Scrot- powder. Scrotum bread. Yeah. Washing powder might have the and, heads. Yeah, head bread. I mean, I mean yeah. these are just a few ideas. So you just give them for free say, here. <coughs> yeah, on this body this line, mm. to a code administrators. Mm. And maybe that was Schwabby, what Schwabby was working on when he fell off the twig. I think Schwabby was working on a number of fronts. Don Talbot and Stephen Foley have always been very lucky in love, and they've taken time out from their hectic schedule to formulate their approach to wooing. The lads have condensed their vast knowledge into three easy steps, now available for the first time in the Sports Lover's Guide to the Bedroom. As Don Talbot says in the forward, it's as simple as one, two, three. One, meet someone nice. Two, drive them home. Three, take off their clothes and take off. Don and Steve's Sports Lover's Guide to the Bedroom is now available once again at all good bookstores and service stations. Uh, Roy, uh, <clears throat> Bobby Brown is oh, a bit of a guy. Oh, Whitney's, uh, Whitney's Tom. <laughs> Beautifully put. Now, uh, obviously Bobby Brown's just been in Australia. We obviously didn't want to do this, uh, you know, story while he was here because it would inflame. Passions. And passions give people the wrong idea. Mm. Uh, single Bobby Brown has an insatiable sexual appetite and he's cheating on his superstar wife. Oh, yes. According to, uh, obviously, the In The News column of The New Idea. Who's that written by? Well, unfortunately, I quickly scanned to see if I could find a person responsible for the article and there's only a red dot at the bottom. <laughs> so, I assume either they didn't have enough space to write in. Mm, the Scarlet Pimple. <laughs> That's right, and so they used his or her mark. Mm. The red dot will know who we're referring to. Uh, Sly's brush with death is curiously <laughs> author the same person. <laughs> <laughs> now, Bobby is in and out of bed with different women uh, around the world, as told to the red dot by a former bodyguard, Joe Bushfan. <laughs> Joe Bushfan? Is yes. that somebody's actual name? <laughs> it's a nom de plume. A nom de dot. <laughs> Joe Wiggle. Bushfan has obviously got to be Joe Bugner. Joe Bugner has said that Bobby has wriggled between the shoots with dozens of women during his bizarre 10-month marriage to the loving but naive Whitney, according to Bushner. Those closest to Bobby have begged him to stay faithful to Whitney for the sake of their marriage and their beautiful baby. But Bobby is proud of his 
on the job ability and he's continuing as if he were still single. The only difference uh, between, uh, you know, obviously uh, before and now is that he, he wears the mute on the flute. Joe Bushner says that in Australia, he, uh, you know, this Bobby ripped out a chandelier at the Posh Hotel that cost him 2500 mm. There was another 2000 he had to shell out for smashing a fancy lamp. Oh, yeah. And in Manila this month, uh, Bobby what, was... Sher Sherbet style, trashing a... Sherbet style, or yeah. Billy Idol style. Billy Idol style, yeah. yeah. Billy, Billy Idol style. In. Oh, he could. <laughs> or Keith Moon style. That's going back to 69 now. <laughs> I don't want to hear any more talk about 69 today. Uh, in Manila this month, uh, the Big B was getting so on the job, he had trouble getting him on the plane. Mm. He hardly ever stopped chasing women from the time he woke up, from the time he collapsed at night. And uh, Joe Bushner lost count of the number of girls who came to Bobby's room. Yeah. He uh, He's on the job with a bottle and also into the green. Joe says he's never seen anything like it. Uh, he said, I know just what Bobby has been up to because it's my job to watch him constantly. What I saw breaks her, my heart. I grew to know and respect Whitney as a person. If she knew what Bobby's been up to, she'd be straight headed for the divorce court. Roy, you know Bobby Brown mm. well better than anybody else I know, apart from Liz Gock. Uh, uh, how, uh, how, true, how much truth is there in this report from Aussie Joe Boozner via the red dot yeah. in, in, in one of the weekly magazines? Uh, look, I, I think it's absolutely accurate. Yes. Yeah, you know, Bobby, uh, I'd describe Bobby and probably other people have described him as well, <clears throat> very simply as a wild man. <laughs> He's the wild man of pop. He's the wild man of music. He's just a wild man who suffers from prolapses. You know, obviously things are standing to attention 24 hours a day. Yeah. And the only way he can feel normal man, his parlance, not mine, is to get on the job. Now, <clears throat> it's a sickness, and I think we've just got to feel a little bit sorry for Bobby. He's, uh, you know, it's not uncommon. I think Michael Douglas uh, has been attending uh, therapy and clinics. clinics, Betty Ford style, because of his, quote, addiction to sex. Uh, I think Bobby suffers from this as well. Uh, but as Bobby said to me, uh, you know, many years ago, I was in the company of him and Joe Bushner, Joe uh, Bushner, I should say, and uh, he said, uh, in servicing the world, I'm doing the world a service. <laughs> Did he actually say that? that? That's what he said. And how does Joe stand the pace, take the pace? I mean, let's face it, Joe isn't, get, isn't getting, getting any younger. younger no. I mean, I don't want to put the mockers... was his big year, yeah. wasn't it? I don't want to put the mockers on, Joe. That's when he was the Bobby Brown of boxing. Yes, that's right. Not that that's anyone right. knew at that stage, because Bobby wasn't born. <laughs> but how does... But in Arco style, you could sort of look backwards and forwards at the same time. Yeah, with he, Gestalt. Vis-a-vis the, you know, the Brown. Yeah. <laughs> Read in the Brown. <laughs> Has that ever been done? You know, you sort of a people set up a shingle saying, I read Brown, just ring me when you've got, a, when you've got, a, when you've got something for me to look at. <laughs> I.e. every day. <laughs> The only two well, people I like know it. who read the brown you know, beautifully are Arco and Sheeds. You're on The Life, live across Australia on Triple J. Joe's always been a party bloke. You know, he takes him back, as I say, to 69 to when he was Hugh Hefner's chum. And, uh, you know, Joe was always over at a Hughes mansion and one thing would lead to another and they'd be wriggling about and then, whoo, on the phone. Uh, then, or in those days it was a smoke. And then wriggling around again and then another smoke. Then wriggling around again and then, poof, better go to bed. Catch a few Zs, as Joe used to say. Uh, better punch out a few Zs. Z's. Z's. Yeah. Then it'd be, four wake up. Bit on of, the job. Bit of brekkie, on the job. Wriggling about on the phone. Wriggling about, smoke. Wriggling about, phew, what am I going to do? Nothing. Wriggling about. Have a fight. Have a fight. Go back to Hughes. Uh, wriggling about. Talk about So Bobby he's Brown. used to that sort of world, that mm. sort of unfamiliar world to many. Uh, but I think he, he's finding the pace, obviously, these days, a little bit hard to keep up with. I mean, as I can tell, Joe just used to sit around in the car asleep. And, Roy, what will happen here? Do you think uh, Joe will tire of Bobby before Bobby tires of Joe? Oh, I think Whitney will tire of Bobby before Joe tires of Bobby or Bobby tires of Joe. Do you think any chance of Whitney might take up with Joe? Whitney Houston and Joe Bushner? Yeah. Well, I think that's old news. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I am the speaking Michael Stick you are listening to on the Triple J. Neil Fraser, a big player in the days of the funny tennis, I am thinking. Uh, 
Yeah, I, I am thinking the Australian players giggling in their trousers. So much they be wet when they talk of him in the Davis Cup for so long. I have won Wimbledon once. For this reason, I am famous. And this is why I talk of Neil Fraser, because I am famous. A backless sports coat for men from Roy, HG and AB. Lewd where it counts. Lewd from behind. Turn around and shock. Turn around and shake. For top line players who want to turn around when they fool around. Roy, moving on, the, the Olympic Games. Uh, now, obviously, China has... Stolen a march, so well, to speak, a long march on uh, the Sydney Olympic the bid. The Entombed Warrior. The Entombed Warrior. Mm. Uh, now, they're fantastic. I don't know whether everybody's had a geek at an Entombed Warrior, but it's a... It's they look a better as a bunch, don't they? They do. When you've got 50,000 of the buggers looking at you. That's right. It's quite a daunting image. That's when you've right. only got one, you feel as if you could bloody kick the thing over, couldn't you? <laughs> just, well, see, it creep, doesn't scare me much. Well, creep up and just put one a of them up its date, <laughs> at the very least. They're 2,000 years old. Uh, they've uh, been dug up. Uh, in the uh, you know in the in this tremendous part of China where people did go around burying things all those years ago, obviously mm. about the turn of uh, Christendom, mm. uh, when Christendom came into being, it's been described giving the IOC Olympic uh, Is it pre -ming? Museum. Pre -ming? I would be definitely yeah. pre Ming, uh, and uh, it's terracotta, of course, it, mm. it, and people have described it as a blatant bribe. Very disappointing. China is not playing by the rules, said uh, Damien Keogh of the Sydney Kings. Australian Olympic uh, Committee Chief Executive Perry Crosswaite, under pressure of intensive questioning with the telephone book and the uh, the bright light, the revealed bungers. That, the bungers revealed that Sydney's bid, uh, or the Sydney Bid Committee, had only forked up a gift of a mere fifteen thousand mm. dollars. What did they spend the fifteen thousand dollars? They spent it on a bronze sculpture depicting a gymnast by London-based Australian artist John Robinson. So here we have an entombed warrior, 2,000 years old, conservatively valued at about $4 billion, million mm. and we cough up 15,000 sculpture. In fact, I think that's overvaluing it too. I mean, I think $15. I think he's made his mistake there yes. and moved the decimal point three points to the left. He yeah. should move it back to the right. $15. The Chinese government last week also chipped in. You can have your entombed warrior if we get the bit, and we're throwing in a pair of giant... What sort of vases are they, Roy? These are Clasoni vases. Clasoni vases, each mm. worth about $40 million each. Mm. It's a big, it's, a, it's, a, it's, Shen, a, it's an impressive gift. Is this going to Helvetia? It, it, it's a Switzerland, oh. <laughs> yes. Uh, it's a, a Chen Xiong. Uh, Beijing's Communist Party said, we look upon the International uh, Olympic Committee as God, their wish is our command. If they want 100 terracotta and tomb warriors, they can have them. Oh. Uh, now, the terracotta and tomb warriors dug up in 1974. Oh. Uh, they date from the Qin Shi Huang uh, period, oh, well, that yes. was the emperor. Yes. Uh, regard as priceless, dot, dot, dot. Oh. And uh, I think China has turned down in a feet of peak, 100 million at least for them. Oh. And I think it's up to us to come up with something a lot better well, I think than a, a, well, you know, well. an acrobat. In bronze. In bronze. It is, it is a bit embarrassing, isn't it? Look, I, I, I don't know. Look, I, I, I ran this up the flagpole with Rod McGeoch well before the Entombed Rot Warrior was part of the puzzle. Because, uh, uh, as, well <laughs> as you well know, we were expecting a bit, of a bit of a puff to come from Beijing that was unexpected. We, we knew they were going to pull something out of the bag. Uh, I must admit, I, I didn't think of an entombed warrior, bloody warrior. I, I, I just didn't right. think that was going to be part of the puzzle at all. I thought they were going to get Mao. Well, yeah. Well, we'll see. I, I was. T I said to Roddy McGill, I said, Rod, listen, Brett White is dead. Why don't we dig him up and take him over to Switzerland, put him in the museum? Uh, we could take Bob Menzies as well, one or two others, Xavier Herbert. Dallas Donnelly. Dallas Donnelly. Harold Holt. Harry Holt. Yeah, oh, there wouldn't not, be anything well, inside. No, 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 just, just a, a box. Snorkel. With yes. Yeah. And a plaque. Mm. Take them over and steal their thunder. Yeah. So if they had them there in, you know, differing, obviously differing states of decomposition, uh, just sitting there hermetically sealed in, uh, in glass pers or perspex boxes for the Swiss to go and have a bit of a sneer at or a bit of a look at, and they, they would be interested, Swiss, very sophisticated people. Uh, they would love that sort of thing from Australia. I would have thought that would have put us ahead and would have made the entombed warrior just look just a little bit ordinary. Yeah, but because you know, with the entombed warriors, they, they, they reckon at this stage, well, there are 50,000 50, of them they've dug up, but 
they think there are other phalanxes <coughs> of at least that many entombed warriors in mm. the other directions that they're waiting mm. to dig up again. Mm, so times. if you've got a million of the buggers, well, well I'm sure, 250,000. So if you've got 250,000 of them, one of the, getting one of them, I mean, there was only one Brett Whiteley. There was only one Dallas Donnelly. There was only one Bob Menzies. Thank goodness. They're getting three, three absolute one-offs mm. created by nature, not by a couple of bloody, you know, couple of bloody idiots pre-christened them banging away with a bit of terracotta it's not you know product of imagination this is this is truth this is reality this is this is you know the the, the result of bloody bit of dna mm. here in australia but do you think we should go with a with a heritage gift though you know i mean i mean my my thing was oh, well, the I old take parliament point, house well the old parliament house the mcg mm. uh you know so something like that uh, football park uh, from south australia mm. uh, i was thinking of uh, you know obviously the home of the uh, barossa the nuruba tigers mm. the nuruba tigers clubhouse now i know it wouldn't be a great gift in the barossa terms of valley would be impressive well it would to dig that up and dig fly it up. that up fly that over to Switzerland? Well, listen, they, they look, the they, they, they shifted the, the Valley of the Kings. Yeah, they yeah. said it wasn't going to be possible for the Oswan Dam. They did. They cut it up and shifted brick by brick, lump by lump, truck by truck, somewhere else. Yeah. And it still, it looks better, yeah. if you ask me. They put it back together better than it was originally. It's not a sort of knocked about and stupid looking. I think, say, you know, Bross Valley, it's a big ask. A couple of billion tonnes. But I, I dare say the Swiss would love having that, to have... Uh, wine. Mm. <laughs> that sort of wine. Not that it would grow terribly well oh, in that Oh, I think climate, you've got to build an artificial... You've got to build a special room for it. You know, like oh, when you go yes, to see the... Oh, a biosphere. Uh, a biosphere. Indeed, when you go to see mm. the... One, biosphere 3. The Mary Rose, you know, the one they dug mm. up from, uh, you know, out there in the uh, Solent yes. in uh, England. It's yes. in a biosphere. You know, biosphere. it's all wet. It's huge. Mm. Uh, I don't... Th uh, sure, it's not on the scale of Barossa. Don't get me wrong. You know, it's not even on the scale of Nuriutpa. Mm. But don't get me wrong. You know, you could do all this... Mm. With modern technology, have a big bubble. Yeah. Problem don't. being, though, that I think you could, you, you'd fit about 50 Switzerlands into the Barossa Valley. <laughs> oh, that's all right. <laughs> we might have to be a bit creative with... Uh, what, sort of half the Barossa Valley stacked on top of the other half <laughs> in a biosphere? <laughs> well, there you're talking. There you, there you are talking. Well, I think that would impress them, certainly if we ran that past Juan Antonio when he arrives. Uh, and when he does arrive, I would like all Australians. Is, which airport's he coming in on, actually? Well, I think he's coming to Mascot. I haven't got a date. He's expected to go to Sydney in May, so he's got at least all six right. weeks away. All right. So, so there's obviously plenty of chances to get something up and happening for him. Well, I would like to think a lot of Australians could be there for when Juan Antonio arrives. And I think Roddy McGeoch and the rest of the Australian Olympic Bid Committee should be there, the Sydney 2000 Committee. And wouldn't it be impressive if when the door opens for Juan Antonio getting off his jet, he'd probably be first off, first class, if uh, there was just a, a carpet of nude Australians lying on the ground for him to walk on, wherever he went, with Roddy McGeoch first step off the plane, everyone buffed, lying face down on the tarmac, and he'd walk along into the customs area, there'd be nudes, you know. With the back door spelling, Welcome Juan Antonio <laughs> to the home on of every, the Sydney Olympics. On every back door is a big W, meaning welcome. And I think no matter where he went in Sydney, on foot, obviously, a bit harder to argue Drive the with car driving over. a car. Bob Askin, you're Bob talking Askin about style, sure. But if wherever he walked, there were just nude bottoms, backs, backs of heads, backs of legs to walk on, that would make it very, very, very attractive. Roy, let's face it, we both know Juan Antonio very well. He's decided Too well, because I think that would work. Oh, that's the worry. Uh, now, he's decided to make a very low-key visit to Sydney. Every now and again, you'd have one... Lying face up. Just a bit of a shock. For Juan. For Juan, uh, yeah. In case he lost his step or something, he needed something to latch onto. That's right, and ask where's the nearest toilet or, you know, <laughs> sort of am I on the way to Homebush and things like that. Uh, it's a very, uh, obviously, low-key visit to Sydney, which will be hard given the keen interest in the Olympic bid, and he wanted only to bring his daughter with him. He said he wanted only modest accommodation at Roy's and didn't want to create any fuss, especially on the new Twister night with the international flavour. Um... But, Roy, you know, how low could we go? I mean, we, I mean, he's coming at the wrong time for the Royal Show. Mm. I, I know he's never seen a laughing clown in his life, mm. and I'd like to show him that. And I think that uh, he'd obviously love to get to the Rugby League, and uh, certainly he's probably seen an AFL. I know he's a mad... Uh, he, he's a mad a cats... Yes, yeah. cats man. Yeah. He gets the tapes in over every uh, week of the match when they're playing, of course. And he has uh, a lot of Geelong... Uh, finals appearances on tape, which he gets out and bores a lot of IOC other committee well, people Well, why couldn't we billet him with Gary Ablett? I'm sure Gary wouldn't mind having Juan billeted with him just for a few nights. 
for as long as you want to stay. Well, well max a week. A week. That wouldn't be too hard. I mean, I'm sure Gary wouldn't mind treading on the nerds, getting to his car. When I want news, I want hard information. I want facts, integrity, commitment and analysis. That's why every night at six, I take the team from six, TSL six, Slaven and Nelson. If they didn't do it themselves, they saw it happen. Nerdists, want a hat for the float? Don't know where to start looking. Kim Beasley's Woodwind Outfitters have all sizes of hats for hitting exactly the right note when you want to step out and swing. Uh, Roy uh, Mark Hopkins' son sent me a little clipping oh. from uh, the AFRY services that he'd come across. A simple read. Uh, the giant portrait of Mao Zedong hanging in Beijing's Tiananmen Square was vandalised last week when an unidentified brownish substance was thrown against it, according to witnesses and an official. A spokesperson for the administration of the large central Beijing Square would not give any explanation for the incident which occurred on Friday or say if there had been any res- uh, arrests. Witnesses said the portrait of Mao remained soiled for more than half an hour in the middle of the afternoon. Mao's nose and cheeks were splotched with what looked like rotting fruit or vegetables which trickled over his mouth. Hundred of curious onlookers is immediately massed under the portrait which hangs over the entrance of the Forbidden City, China's former imperial palace, at one end of Tiananmen Square. Those who took pictures were quickly detained by the police who confiscated their film, witnesses said, and the city employees cleaned the portrait after a few minutes. Mm. Doesn't and all go well for Beijing's bid, bid does it? No, I was very disappointed With brown about that. substances being thrown at the, uh, the chairman, mm. Mao Zedong. <laughs> The man who swam the Yangtze, remember? Uh, yes, that's right, the long marches with, uh, with Sun Yat-sen. Chow and Lai. With Chow and Lai. Who, who yeah. can forget? I mean, such a towering figure oh, yeah. uh, was uh, Mao Tse-Tung, as he was in those days, yes. before the revisionists, the phonetic revisionists got involved and he started being called Mao Zedong. Uh, but a tremendous bloke. And, and I don't think it's necessary for Sydney siders and indeed Australians interested in Australia getting the bid up to, to go, go, over to, to go to Beijing Israel. with the idea of, of browning of browning out Mao Zedong, mm. Mm. you know, I don't think it does it does well, you know, because mm. they could be caught. Wouldn't mm. it be embarrassing to be caught with a bit of brown on your hands mm. in front of the portrait of a browned out Mao Zedong? And it's be very hard to explain diplomatically. It'd be embarrassing. Gareth Evans would be involved, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera, you know, saying well, it was regrettable. You know, it's regrettable. <laughs> Not much we could do about it, but regrettable. <laughs> uh, and especially if you coughed up and said, yes, my name is Dan Driscoll, I live in Ultimo. Mm. Uh, and, uh, you know, I, I did it because Sydney. I believe Sydney should get the 2,000 bid. Yes. I mean, that would be the worst possible publicity at this particular juncture, wouldn't it? Yeah, Roy? well, I suppose, well, well, you could say something like uh, Juan Antonio Summerhounds. That would be a good idea. <laughs> yeah. That way. Yes. The Juan defence. Yeah. Long time since a beak in China's heard the Juan defence, I think. <laughs> or it's remembering, if you, if you are browning out portraits in uh, China or thinking of taking a trip... Well, go the whole hog, I oh, rip it down, burn rip, it. Rip, rip it down, torch it, then soil it personally. Uh, that way, I, I think you'd draw a maximum amount of exposure, not only to yourself and certain body parts of yourself. Yes, especially if you did a nude but, but Avon issue, Descent style. <laughs> yeah, of course, or Avon Descent. Oh, is, that, what, was, oh, yeah. is that the revisionist theory, is it? <laughs> Avon right. Descent. That's right. That's right. Avon, Avon, Avon is to Zedong <laughs> as Avon is, is to, to Zedong. <laughs> <laughs> International travellers, the rumours are true. You've had a sniff of Spargo's in LA. You've savoured Vienna World in Goulburn. You've put the feet up round at Ollie Reed's Garage Club. And now in London, there's a breath of fresh air. HG's is now open in Oxford Street, two doors up from the well-credentialed Berkshire Hotel. Just see George, the older brother Neil never thought he had, on the door, and as you slip off the tights, mutter, I'm shooting for the stars tonight, George. Have a room-temperature draft pulled in the James Cook Tavern. Get a plate of breakfast kippers at any time of day dished up by that stop the world I want to get off man Anthony Newley. Watch the lucky coits with a new to the nude Max Bygraves. Hop in the blow off box with Mandy Rice Davies and waltz the night away to the sultry sounds of the Sid James Six with vivacious vocalist Sid Yoga Star Lulu. All this and more at HG's in London. Stop by and pick up the soap. Now uh, Wednesday night, Wednesday night, yes, I am looking forward enormously to the work, the handiwork of the talking beard. I think Ten have given over the whole night from seven until... The whole week, isn't it? 
to the Skye story, yes. the Christopher Skye story. I didn't realise they'd given away Monday and Tuesday to the preamble. I think they're pro- yes, pre- yeah, you you know, pro- promos, and stuff. promos, yeah. and stuff like that. Yeah. Chris, Previews, and- Chris's early work, mm. you know, on the financial paper, Quintex, the rise and fall, and then Wednesday night we get the big one, the interview with the Talking Beard packing down for five hours mm. with Chris and Picks in the lovely circumstance of La Mallorca. Mallorca. That's right. The two hectare, the Lenola is the place that uh, Scacy and Picks live in in Mallorca. It's a holiday oil Europe's worthless, uh, wealthy. It's restful on the eye, according to uh, you, the beard. Mm. A beautiful rustic farmhouse, a blue pool reflecting Mediterranean sun, terracotta, electric gardens and so on. Roy, we were there when he filmed. Mm. What did you make of the whole Scase beard interface? Look, I, I thought there were a couple of... It, it, it was both opening up, wasn't it? Darren opened up like I've never seen him open up before. And his opening up prompted was a catalyst, was, was like pressing the on button or the open button on Christopher Scase and yes. Pixie. Pixie opens up as well. So when they all began crying a couple of hours in, in. there were tears of regret from Darren, you know, about because it triggers off, when you look at failure, it triggers off failure in yourself. You know, and we, we empathise with failure, I think, more, far more often than we empathise with success. Mm. So just as success can make the hairs on the back of your neck go and you, you, you empathise in that way, so with failure can trigger the, uh, the tear ducts to go into overdrive. And to see Darren there blubbering, Chris blubbering, Pixie blubbering, camera crew blubbering, and you and me sort of perplexed. Uh, I, I thought it was just tremendous. To, I just hope they cut it well. I hope they don't leave that sort of gear on the cutting room floor. Because uh, I, I hope when, you know, Pixie cried that they focused in on her and the tears running down her face. When when Chris stands up, you know, and says, you know, I can't even stand up properly anymore and soils himself. I hope that they focus in on this. On the trouser. Yeah. You know what I mean? Because so that was I, funny, I thought that. I, you know, when he did that, I thought that, that he did that as a party turn, trying to liven up the tone. <laughs> Peter you know, Rooster, style. Yeah, that's right, that's right. He was very sad and sombre. Mm. And really, uh, Darren had only asked, you know, any regrets? Yeah. Or, in fact, he didn't know. He said, he said, first up, did you know Ronnie Quinton was retiring this Saturday <laughs> at uh, Randwick? And that brought tears to Chris's yes, eyes. Chris's eyes, Just yes. remembering Ron. To know there was going to be a Ron Quinton free Australia when he returns on uh, the race, you know, when he goes to the racing track. See, things aren't ever going to be the same when he comes back, and he will come back. It'll be a different Australia, different landscape. So people, he won't recognise him. No, they won't. He won't recognise. We won't recognise them. They won't recognise us. That's I don't right. mean personally. I mean, but the world of. That's right. That's right. I mean, you look at the Brisbane Broncos, for example. He might have been interested in football. Different team now. Yeah. The Bears at the Gabba. He Bears wouldn't, he wouldn't Gabba. understand anything he'd about ga- that. He'd go to the Gabba wanting to watch, 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 watch the dogs. <laughs> watch the dogs go around. Yeah, well, that's all gone. That's all gone. All he'll see is the Bears. Going back to the carpet laying, though, obviously it was a very tender moment when he realised that the Australia that he knew and loved was no longer there and it had all moved on. Mm. He got up and the camera was there and he turned around and the brown just came out as if on cue. Mm. Well, I think in all fairness, uh, that, that's a very Spanish thing. That to show that you are absolutely comfortable with someone. <laughs> it's right. We might take a short break. About a Roy had brought tears to my eyes and recollection. Yeah. But as you say, it is a very Spanish thing to do that. To feel comfortable in someone else's home. So much so that you can lay the brown at will. Anyway. Mm. And no, 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 like no, no one takes offence. No. You know, they're, they're more in New Yorker. More, well, they're more likely to take offence if you don't. Yeah. You know, in the digs we were staying at, you know, I looked around, you know, and it said in my halting Spanish, where is the smallest room? Well, that's point and they, they said, do you want to go? And I said, uh, what do you mean, leave? I don't want to leave. I just want to to uh, evacuate. Evacuate 
downstairs in my halting Spanish. And they said, What's the, why leave? Roy there was the rough translation. So I did, because I, you know, I was taken, taken upon. And uh, no one better than not. Yeah, the, 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 the family just kept... <laughs> the family continued on with their normal activities of uh, crushing olives and, uh, you know, that, that, that sort of stuff and making paella. Uh, no one took offence at all, and once I realised the, the the nap of the greens, so to speak, yeah. uh, it, it, life was very comfortable. Yeah. You know, I, I, it, <clears throat> just mysteriously, it seems to get hosed away during the night. Uh, I was going to say, do you think do you think Darren was too harsh on Chris and Pips, or do you think he was he's gone soft? He, he's gone soft. I, I mean, I, I I can't remember, and I'll be interested to see on Monday and Tuesday night mm. the the world of Quintex and Chris that Darren inhabited in mm. those heady days up until about 1988. Yeah. Obviously, the beard was part of all of that somehow. I'm not quite sure how. Mm. But now, uh, you know, has uh, and obviously uh, probably Darren did uh, drop a couple of green ones, uh, you know, in the in the imbroglio. Yeah. Uh, but now, do you think that Darren has gone soft on? Chris? Well, I think so because, as he said, you know, towards the finish, can't help loving that guy can't, that's life can't help loving that guy baby baby man well i mean you you've got to say the bloke is not coming with you know traditional journalistic objectivity <clears throat> yeah, true. you know he, he's a bloke who felt enormous sadness i think for chris in the end as he says chris is living in paradise but it's not the kind of paradise i call paradise yeah he lives in Hawaii when he goes to Paris. That's right. Paris. He's got his place there in Hawaii. Oh, yeah. But you know, but 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 uh, but he, he said to me it was like a bit of a hell of a paradise. You know, if you can invert paradise, that's where Chris is. You know, he's got no friends. Uh, can't speak the language. Can't speak the language. What did you make of his health? I, I thought in the, when you, and people will be able to judge for themselves. I think Chris makes, sorry, uh, Chris makes uh, Darren look very unfit. Mm. Uh, oh, I, I think so. Yeah. Whatever, uh, whatever uh, picture he's doing in the cooking. It's certainly working a treat for Chris. I, I, he looks to me as though he could easily fly back from Spain at the drop of a hat. Yeah, he could be back w w in Australia be within, back tomorrow. within 12 hours. Yeah. That, that's, how I, that's how fit I saw him, without using a plane. I reckon he could run here, Deke style. Uh, that's how fit I thought the bloke looked. Yeah. Uh, and I certainly hope he does come back, because I know there are a lot of friends. and. and He'd uh, love to see him. Yeah. Take him to the football. Yeah. Show him the gabber without the dog track. That's right, have a bit of a chat. Yeah. Ask him to do the party tricks he learned in Spain. In Spain, yeah. Bring a little bit of Spain back to Australia. Oh, yeah, a bit of truth. Yeah. A bit of honesty. And do you think the beard... Um, I mean, I mean uh, what my bottom question is here, is anybody interested? In Does case. anybody care? Why has Channel 10 gone big on this? Do, yeah. do they imagine that maybe uh, Chris has got the wherewithal to buy Channel 10? Yeah, oh, I don't know. I, I guess there might have been a lot of uh, you know, people who invested in the future of Channel 7 in years gone by who may well be interested in uh, Chris coming back and having a few questions fielded vis-a-vis -vis accounts, etc. Yes, yes. You know what I mean? But uh, did you think it was Darren's best interview, though, Roy? I mean, I, I don't, hate to bag the bloke, you know, but the beard has gone. Well, it's very hard with Darren to, to find a best interview. You know, they all sort of meld into one. You know, let's, let's face it, Chris and Pixie aren't the story here. No, of course not. Darren yeah. is. Yeah. It's the way they, Darren reacts to them that is the story, which is typically Darren. Yeah. Uh, so I don't think people are going to see anything. They're just going to see Darren in Spain. It's like a holiday shot. It's like a holiday show. You know, what do I get up to in Spain? I yeah. go and see my very, very good friends, Chris and Pixie. Let's go back. It's comfy as buggery. It's comfy as Roy, why did you turn to the Lithgow Bank? Oh, hard one, Paul. Look, I, I've always been taken, you know, right from the outset with their advertising. It's always been very, 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 very subtle. Uh, the first time I, I saw a simple but substantial and very, very, very elegant bed flute wrapped in a $100 bill, well, it caught my eye, and I said to myself there and then, here's a bank that talks my language. And once my interest was aroused, they turned out to be, well, tremendous people, Paul, with tremendous ideas. The Lithgow Bank, where the back door is always open. Mm, two triple. Roy, uh, you've been on the phone there and uh, canvassing suggestions for what we should do to get the, to rest back the lead in the race for the Beijing Bid 2000, vis-a-vis -vis the gifts to one Antonio. Yes. Well, what are people saying? What are the faxes and phones telling Roy Slavin? Well, the feeling seems to be uh, the Olga, one of the Olgas is just an old rock, that this is the way Juan Antonio and, and the rest of the committee in Switzerland, uh, in, you know, might view it, that it doesn't really have enough 
Oomph. Oomph. Yeah. You know, human involvement. What was suggested was the Sydney Harbour Bridge, and I'd throw in the Opera House and Benelong well, Point as a job as, lot. As a job lot. I think there'd be a place, uh, you know, in, uh, in, in Geneva mm. for a harbour bridge. Mm. Oh, I'm sure they'd be able to accommodate it and, and, uh, and uh, the, the Opera House, obviously. Uh, a few of Dawn Fraser's Stanley steamers have been suggested, uh, you know, obviously presented to Juan Antonio on a blue cushion with, a, with an Australian flag hanging in them. Well, I don't think this is such a bad idea. I mean, Juan might demand a bit of verification. But I think, I think uh, if Juan was to be attended by famous Australian... Olympians of years gone by, if, say, Ron Clark was there in attendance all the time to open the car door for him or to cook his breakfast, make his codley's egg, make his toast, if Dawn was there to help out as well, uh, you know, as, you can get as many Olympians as you like uh, involved there right up to the current day, just hanging around loitering about, making sure he was very, 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 very comfortable. And I think that would go down very, very... I think that would send a clear signal that we were prepared to put in for the bid. Uh, Roy, uh, do you think the idea, I know he's a mad Billy Thorpe and the Aztecs buff. Yeah. Uh, Thorpe's guitar. Uh, Thorpe's guitar. Or restaging Sunbury for him. Uh, oh. Say so Sunbury circa 1973. Yes. Uh, the You Poopa Do song yeah. and things like that. Yeah. With Thorpey. Uh, I mean, obviously, uh, Thorpey and, uh, you know, the pig and uh, the rest of the band. Uh, you Kevin get Tully to reform. Well, <laughs> go on, on with it. Mm. Uh, Spectrum would obviously have to be there. Yeah. But, and maybe get out, um, you know, Johnny O'Keefe. Yeah. Uh, I think Johnny O'Keefe did make a triumphant return to Sunbury one year. Uh, so this would be quite an interesting uh, exercise. Uh, Hosted by Bert. <laughs> He's still got a lot to offer. Oh, he's got an enormous amount to offer. But unfortunately, I don't think he ever appeared at some point. No, I know and that. And I know Juan Antonio would have the books and the oh, program yes, notes right, and right. so on. And so, hello, they're putting one over on me here. Mm. But restaging somebody is not a bad idea, is it? Because it's got, you know, obviously everything going for it. You know, rock and roll yeah. and noise. People gathered in a swamp, uh, much in the manner as they will be in the buildings, uh, you know, in uh, when we do get the bid uh, in Homebush. Uh, because let's face it, probably by then we won't be able to afford to build anything. Uh, much in the manner of Atlanta's having Atlanta, trouble now. Yes, yes. Having yes. trouble now. But, uh, Roy, the, it does require some thought, though, doesn't it? Oh, it does. You just it's can't... a tone exercise, isn't yeah, it? Yeah, you can't rush into it. No. <laughs> you can't rush into it. I, I think we've got from now until May to come up with something that that is poignant, substantial, mm. meaningful, valuable. One word. Arco. Arco. Let's give him a arco. You're a fit, hard-hitting, hard-riding, hard-button, no-nonsense tear-away with the world at your feet and you're looking for something that will fill the hole between morning tea and lunch. Well, listen up, pard. Roy and HG have snapped off something long, brown and hard that will have you full in seconds. That's the all-new Totally Ian Roberts Bar. It's totally yum. It's totally fun, and it's totally Ian. And I did get uh, a letter from uh, Vicky Hibbert in Frankston uh, saying two reasons for writing. Uh, first, to say how much uh, she and her husband enjoy the shows. More importantly, we're both amused and intrigued by your choice of terminology when describing, uh, you know, certain, uh, well, let's face it, facts of life. Yeah. My husband nearly choked on several occasions, and I must admit the frequent use of words like date, flute and carpet make me laugh so hard I often stop breathing momentarily. Oh, isn't that? That's a problem, isn't it? it what is about Axminster then, Vicky? Hey, wait a minute. Flute and date are obvious, but would you be pleased to find the word carpet either on air or in a brief well, response you've got to... Well, you've got to lay some Axminster, Vicky. Well, carpet, some brown oh. Axminster, Vicky. Yeah, yeah. Can we make it any clearer, Vicky? Uh, I don't think we have to. I just wonder where this person's been. Obviously a recent convert to the show, do you think, well, Roy? I have no idea, actually. Uh, but I'm glad we can... It's easy to clear up, though, isn't it? Yeah, indeed. You know, when you can put... If the, with a hose. Uh, yeah, if <laughs> you put the date... And the carpet together, mm. and you've got the most natural of bodily functions imaginable, right. and uh, a lot of fun to boot. Mm. Uh, now, she asked whether on air or a brief written response to the letter in time, if oh, we have on time. Air. Done it. We on air, we've done it. Right. Now, if you've got any problems, Vicky, <clears throat> just ask about, mm. you know. Mm. Ask other people. You know, do you listen to the sport? Yeah, you know, nudge the person next to you. If they're likely looking tight, nudge them in the ribs with the elbow. Just say, Axminster. Yeah. Yeah. Let me see what response you get. Yeah, or, but you know, one of those psychological tests, since we're talking about... Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. You know, first mm. response to Axminster, Day. carpet. Mm. <laughs> Word association. Uh, one more thing, um, you know, uh, obviously, uh, you know, your vivid imaginations mean that my husband quite often has to say, it's not real love, 
and they're only joking. Mm. I have in fact quoted things I have seen or heard on the show the next day at work as being fact. Yes. It's a worry, isn't it? <laughs> <laughs> Vicky concludes the letter. Well, well, I don't know, Vicky. Oh, I think that's there tremendous. Are a lot of worse things that could happen to you. Yeah. Yeah. You Andy, I mean, I can't think of many, but, but I'm sure you know you might have to spend you know six months in a caravan with Joe Bugner. I, I, I'd, <laughs> I'd, I'd say, that. I'd say that you'd be worse off in that circumstance. You're learning a lot and loving it while the sloop heads north on Tool Talk and Wisecracks. down the deep end up to your buttocks and tool talk and wise cracks uh, yes Roy the Logies last night we were thrilled to be there uh, I, let's find so I can't remember the last time I've missed a Logie but as soon as I knew that Bert was in charge I, 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 I penciled out a lot of a lot of what a considered competing appointments and yes. uh, made a beeline uh, to be there. And I wasn't disappointed. No, as soon as I saw not. Bert come on and then I saw the routine with Daryl Summers and we can't hear you down the front, Bert, and all that sort of stuff. And Bert was just magnificent there, even though Daryl was desperately trying to upstage him. You and couldn't. You You're couldn't. No, that's it. All stage. eyes were on Bert. Yeah, they were. And, uh, and what people probably would not realise, HG, is, is when the program goes to commercial breaks, that's when Bert, Bert really comes into his comes own. Into his he own. works blue. He does. Uh, he has every. He had his trousers down, you know, within moments of saying, we'll be back in a moment. Boom, they hit the floor. Well, he's got the ripcord. <laughs> yeah. Away they go. Yeah. The uh, fall away trousers, yeah. you know, cut in four pieces <laughs> and off they fall. And then he's just working the crowd. <laughs> oh, no. Uh, That's right. Remember, he had a, a microphone quite low, just at sort of um, gusset height. Yes. Flute height. Flute height. And uh, when he went up to that microphone without, or I should say, sans trousers, and just started whacking the microphone, very funny. Well, the, the other thing is that people thought that uh, they'd seen it all, and then in the next ad break, mm. he came back, flute mic, and he worked the crowd over doing a tremendous... Morse code. Well, I was going to say Morse code first up, but then, of sort course... Of Fantastic. And then the next time out, you thought, hello, he's going to do more Morse. Yeah. And then he started whistling. He started whistling on it. And he did a beautiful, he did a terrific version of Happy Wandering. You know, mm. uh, you know, I must go wandering, dot, dot, dot. Yeah. And everybody up whistling that. Mm. Then he came back and he sang uh, Paul Simon's Bridge Over Trouble Water yeah. Through the Bed Flute. And then the next time, you know, so he just come... Sort style. Indeed. He came yeah. back topping and topping and topping. Well, that was it. You yeah. know, you couldn't see the lips moving. No. But there it was, you know, Bridge Over Trouble Water, yeah. dot, dot, dot. And, <laughs> Very uh, funny. Yeah. It was. And then having the presence of mind just to zoop, up with the trousers, lights, red light back on the camera. Absolute professional. And I thought the crowd were very professional by not giving anything away. And when Darren Hinch came out, mm. and you saw what 10 have, mm. you know, seeing all the elements, yes, you do, of course, when you watch Channel 10, you know, you see Darren Hinch, but you don't make the connection between Darren and Bert Newton because no. they're on at the different ends of the day. Yeah, or uh, Bert and, and, the, and the other show's new faces and so on because it's not on with Darren preceding it. But when you see Darren and Bert together, you realise yeah. what riches 10 do have. Yeah. And that tremendously old, wily fox at twilight, the talking beard, came out and discussed something he didn't want to discuss. You couldn't get a word like out himself. of him. <laughs> Where he was going, yeah. what he was doing, but, but, you couldn't you know, get a word out of him. When uh, you know, I, I thought when Reg Grundy came out to be inducted into the Hall of Fame, I uh, I'd forgotten just how what a tremendous amount of entertainment Reg Grundy has given people over so many years—35 years. Uh, I think Reg started with Wheel of Fortune 35 years ago, and the format has kicked on. It's now in hundreds of countries throughout the world. Uh, the production companies that Reg now owns are springing up like mushrooms all over the world. And I thought when young Jason Donovan came out and made a very moving speech, uh, thanking Reg for the opportunities he's given so many Australian people to succeed, and many have, I thought it was a profoundly moving moment. And I thought, you know, Rhonda Birchmore falling over during the dancing it didn't detract from the night at all. Oh, it's a, Last yeah, night showed yeah, so. was that variety, there is still yeah. not enough variety. <laughs> Old 
Christian bloody variety on Australian yeah, television. I mean, we're going on and on what? about it on this show, but nobody in nobody television will listen. do it. Yeah. I mean, well, it's not an impossible dream to get a show together which has a snake charmer come out and do yeah. the first act. We go to an ad break. Bert comes back and introduces a couple of unlikely people, say John Farnham, The Voice, yes. and... Uh, Jane you know, Scarley. Yeah, Jane Scarley and Tom, Tom Jones. Jones to sing a trio yeah. of uh, I Like It Both Ways. Then they go to another ad break and then come back uh, with a bit of uh, Rhonda Birchmore and the, uh, you know, the Gordon Folds dancers yes. uh, out there with doing Jack, this stuff. I think it was Jack Webster and uh, David uh, Atkins. Yes. And dancing works on television. Yeah. You know, don't forget, Patty was a dancer. <laughs> and it was great to see Patty come out last night. And when's Bert, you know, obviously... The Bert... Clearpool Singers. Uh, don't well, tell me you couldn't have a show like that. I mean, Red, so it's sure, the Reg, Red Skelton Grundy. For, uh, format. I mean, Reg Grundy and Red Skelton, put them together. Uh, I don't think Red Skelton's still with us. I no, could be well, pretty Bert wrong. could play Red. Uh, Roy, uh, you know, the winners last night, were there any surprises there? Uh, I mean, I don't want to read the list out, everybody's familiar, you know, Ray yeah. Martin got the gold, Logie, yeah. Silver Logie, Sweetie. Gary Sweet, yes. Uh, Georgie Parker, uh, you know, who hadn't been on TV much recently, uh, managed to scoop the pool of the uh, Australian popular actress. Uh, Home and Away, most popular series, Tracks of Glory, dot, 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 Jennifer Burns, uh, Hey, Hey, It's Saturday, yeah. uh, Fast Forward, Daryl Summers, on and on it goes. Yeah. What do you think? Yeah, look, I, I Current thought... Affair? No, I thought, I thought all the winners, I thought that was fine. And, and the ABC, actually... The ABC has done so much for Australian entertainment. People don't appreciate this, and it's only when you have awards nights like that's why I love them, that's why I always attend them. You can't keep me away. Even though you've probably got a million things you'd that's rather right. do. Yeah, yeah, you can't keep me away because it acknowledges, by and large, what the ABC puts into the Australian entertainment industry, which is an enormous amount. Uh, and Roy, you know, when you think of Australian television oh. and you see a night like that, it has come a long way. I mean, Bert... Probably was better last night. The hair looked more natural, as I said in the opening yeah, comments. Yeah. Looked more lifelike. Who's been doing it? Well, I, don't ask me the hard questions. Who should Bert be talking? I, I think I think Bert uh, has his own uh, way. Yeah, way of doing it, mm. and he can't communicate this to anybody else to get he's the same results. He's always standing working with one mirror, isn't he? <laughs> it is a handicap when you've got to look like that to get together. Just one mirror. He does a strand by strand. The only thing I would, uh, I would disagree with, with last night's ceremony, is that I don't really think we need the international stars anymore because many Australian stars are international uh, stars. Uh, so when Johnny Spencer from Say Hello Law came out, I thought, who? Uh, what are you doing here? Uh, you know, I threw... I, I wanted, I, I, you know, it was much like seeing a New Zealander, I, you know, the phlegm. Uh, well, he walked off drenched. Yeah, I, I mean, it didn't yeah. look. It probably didn't look to people at home. No, sure. That he was drenched, yeah. but he was. He was. He was. Yeah, and, the, and the Mills, he was, the, the, the Mills sisters. Well, oh, I didn't think there was any need for them to come out. Well, admittedly, they wore absorbent clothes. Yeah. they knew what they were in for. <laughs> That's <laughs> right. A tremendous gollying. <laughs> gollying from uh, from everyone. But I, I, I think Australia. We have enough Australian stars now. Well. You know, let's face it, we travel a bit. We've been to Uruguay recently, Thailand. We've been uh, to Alaska. We've been up to Reykjavik. And whenever we get off, it's either rugby league or AFL football, the first show we've seen, or cricket. We see Richie yeah. Benoit up in those places a lot. Yeah. Or you get Home and Away, followed by uh, Neighbours, mm. followed by East Street, followed by, uh, you know, Country Practice. Yeah. Tremendous viewing, and people love it. That's what I'm always saying. You know, bring in as much as your bloody English gear as you like. Because it's horrible. Bring in as much as your yank stuff as you like. Because it stinks. Because it stinks and people start to appreciate just how good the local product is. This week in Roy Magazine, the steamy holiday snaps Aussie supermodel Elle McPherson and fun-loving weatherman Brian Bury hoped would never see the light of day. Canterbury Bankstown superdog Bar Lamb says Fiona McCullum is a sick joke when it comes to predicting the rugby league penalty count. Former Hawthorne strongman Dermot Brereton in a no-holds-barred interview confirms the rumours that if pushed he would bunk in with Aussie test Tyro Craig McDermott. John Hewson sets tongues wagging with his two-hour session in Canterbury with Lady Colin Campbell. A country practice star Shane Porteous goes north to spend a fortnight living with his special frog friends. All this and more in Roy magazine. Out now with a made-over Neil Fraser looking as sultry as ever on the front cover.
Roy, I suppose we have to talk about it. I suppose we have to talk about this Ashes Tour, but it hasn't got off to a good start. I mean, why is AB knocking over stumps, getting on the blue with fast bowlers and, and calling, uh, you know, the local media a bunch of, uh, a bunch of sleeps? Yeah. Uh, I mean, it saddens me. I know it saddens you. What is going on in uh, AB's mind? Uh, is, as Keith Miller suggests, is a fraud and a has-been? And what did you make of Keith's yeah. comments? Oh, look, Keith's comments uh, I, I found very, very interesting. Uh, I... I I always listen to Keith. Whenever Keith has something to say, I'll always le- I'll always bend an ear to Keith. That's what I've always so much, so much to say. And Keith, uh, I know you're listening, and uh, thanks for the many memories you gave us, Keith, in your playing day. And uh, I'll never forget the '87 story, uh, Keith. I could hear it once more now. <laughs> I'd love to hear it again. You know? I, I would. I, I never talk because every time you hear it, it's exactly the same. But the, the details get a little bit blurry if it's not Keith that's telling the story. It's such a funny little story, and uh, Keith's obviously dined off it for a hell of a long time. But uh, I, look, Keith, if you're listening, ring us up and tell us the story again. I, I know there's a whole there's new a whole, audience. There's a whole generation <laughs> of kiddies who've never heard the '87 story, but I. I, I don't want to tell it because no one tells it like Keith. So, Keith, give us a bell if you wouldn't mind, old fella. Uh, look, Keith uh, did recount the time this week when uh, he couldn't bowl. It was a test match uh, on a green top in the old dart, Australia v England. The Don was captain and uh, Keith had a buggered back. Mm. Uh, you know how conditions can change in the UK. You can go to bed feeling really, really warm. Uh, and you throw the blankets off because it, uh, you are too hot. And then a cold snap occurs, and with Keith, this is what happened. He was lying on his stomach sleeping with no blankets or doona on. Cold change came. He was unaware of it. Woke up. Oh, no. Back's buggered. Now, uh, I think Ray Linwell might have opened the, uh, the bowling on that morning. And at the end of the over, Keith uh, was called to the middle by Don, who threw him the cherry, the pill, the reader, might have been a duke, and uh, said, Keith, uh, do you want to open your shoulders? Do you want to have a roll the arm over? Keith politely returned the ball to the Don and said, no, I can't. And that's where the matter rested. Keith wasn't uh, asked to bowl for the rest of that innings or the rest of that day until his back was better. Now, Keith went on to say that if, you know, the Don had spoken to him in the way that AB spoke to Billy Bloodnut, uh, he'd have kicked him up the date then and there. He said that uh, you've got to respect those who are in control of you. You've got to respect your captain, and you can't respect a cursing captain. Uh, The Don, he said, never swore. The Don, who was a tremendous captain in the 30s and the 40s, who'll who'll ever forget the Invincibles of 48, uh, the Don never said bugger. He never said bloody. He never said poo. He never said root. He never used any of that sort of racy, sailor-blushing language, and I think we respect him all the more for having done that. Now, I think AB, something snapped in AB. Uh, I don't know whether it's, it is a language thing that certain parts of his brain have, uh, that, that house language have closed, have shut down, leaving the only functioning areas, those blue areas that, uh, you know, when he was learning this sort of language in his adolescence in Mossman, uh, when he was, say, 12 through to 15, this is the sort of language that he would have uh, been privy to in the schoolyard. And maybe it's, uh, you know, AB is, adva- you know, is getting senile. Uh, it does happen where you get senility happening in the, younger, in the younger man. Not that AB is all that young anymore. He's 37. And uh, I, I, I find it difficult now. The conversations I've had with him in the, uh, the last week or so, HG, I've been a little bit embarrassed because he's been swearing at me. Yeah. Now, I think there's a problem there. There is a disease whereby one can't help swearing. Yes. And maybe Alan's got it. And I think we've got to be, as a nation, sympathetic. Sympathetic and just ask Alan to communicate in written form. I'd like to see him out there, and I said this to Keith, I'd like to see him out there with a little notepad, just writing things down, messages down, in slips, giving it to the second slip, say if it was Mark War, and getting Mark to run up to Billy with the message, you know, come here, come here, come here, etc., etc. I think that's a much more feasible way to go. Or either that, or I think Ian Chapler suggested that AB should uh, uh, give up cricket just for a few days and have a round of golf. Uh, well, I can't imagine anything upsetting AB more than getting his language, his tongue right off the, 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 the language spleen. 
uh, than getting out there with a, you know, having a game of golf. I'd rather see him take a boxing or something like that. It's something absolutely physical. That's mm. what I'd like to see him do. Have a game of football or something like that. Have a chance to hit someone. I think that's what AB needs. AB needs to be wearing a pair of shorts and a pair of gloves in a ring with someone who hates him. Well, obviously he does want to hit something. He had a go at the stumps and then apologised for that. He had a go at Craig McDermott. And I did like that bit, you know, test me and you'll be on the first plane home. On the home. first plane home, son. I, I thought that was tremendous. Mm. And I'd love to see, uh, you know, Blood Nut Billy the Kid. I'd love to see him on the first plane yeah, home. Push, 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 push right up to yes. force him to put him on the plane. Yes. And every time rub his nose in it, you know, what do I have to do to get on the plane? Yeah. You know, is that bad? He drops yeah. the tox, you know, let's yeah. one go at the Lords. Yeah. You know, straight into the members thing. Everybody dies of asphyxiation. Mm. You know, is that enough for your AB? Uh, pants you know. Lord Ted. Yeah, that's AB, right. Hey, <laughs> enough? Am I going on the now? plane? Yeah. Because uh, they couldn't send him. Who nah. were they having the bowling with? That's Who right. would they have in the bowling with? Yeah. You know, I mean, what an idle threat. Yes. You know? Yeah. It just does it, you know. If You'll you, be if on you the first plane, honey. It's so you, silly, so childish. I know, I know. I know. You know, because I know for a fact stuff. what Billy did, it, it went off at drinks, uh, sorry, at tea, got AB's bag and filled it with his own Stanley steamers. Just dropped the togs there in front of the whole team yeah. and steamered all through his bag. Yeah. And closed it up, put it back and said, hey, AB. Where's my ticket, baby? The other thing is, uh, I, uh, after that uh, big imbroglio last week when it was obviously revealed, you know, they were on the blue together, I saw Simo come out, and correct me if I'm wrong, he came out and said, you know, what's the fuss? It's a man's game played by men. Mm. Conveniently ignoring the fact that Australian women's cricket has dominated world cricket in only yeah. a way mm. that the men's side could hope to imagine mm. being able to dominate. Let's face it, this guy round over there at the moment is placed virtually playing for the wooden spoon of world cricket. Yes. Having yeah. just uh, squeaked out of New Zealand with a with a win yeah. in the one days and been flattened by the West Indies last summer, the oh. Australian side is now oh. trying to rest oh. or trying to force Britain into the position of wooden spooners. But it can't be a happy ship. That's what worries me. Mm. It can't mm. be happy. Can't hap be happy. You know. No, you can't be happy with a grumpy old man setting the agenda. You know they're not in. You know, AB's idea of fun and which determines the idea of fun for the team is just off the pace. You know, you, a lot of these young kiddies, Shane Warne, he's, he's described as a, the world's sexiest cricketer. He wants to get out on the tear. Yeah. He wants to get out and about wearing civvies, uh, going to dance clubs and meeting people people who are like-minded and getting involved in no 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 nocturnal activities, which does necessitate the removal of trousers and the operation of the bed flute. Yeah. Now, that's essentially what he wants to do. Uh, AB, on the other hand, has a different idea. He just wants to, you know, go out with the blokes, order, a, go, go to a, a restaurant, order a nice wine, you know, order for the players what they're going to eat, you know, uh, a nice... Uh, You'll have a seafood cocktail, seafood cocktail a merv, cetera, and then yeah. stumpy, you look a bit yeah. peaky, you might have a steak. So they sit there just, you know, opening their mouths to change legs, and it's very, very embarrassing when they don't want to be out in the tear. But see, the right. tear days have gone for AB. Yeah. He's forgotten what it's like to be a young buck in a foreign country with no one peering over your shoulder and a lot of people pointing at you and saying sex. He's forgotten what that's like, you know? And I think it's up to the players to get AB back to earth, to, you know, wake him up with a, with a ice water down the trousers. Shave the eyebrow. Shave the Short eyebrow. Shoot the bed. Short get shoot the, the jets bed. and shove him into him. Yeah, you know, things that's like right. That. The, old, the, the old tricks. Yeah, and then take him out and get him, introduce him to some, you know, interesting young people who would be interested in sitting in a corner listening to an old cricket a mouth off. Now, I can't really imagine anyone who'd be interested in doing that. I mean, they might have to uh, be lured in some manner, but I'm sure England's a big place. England's a, a big place. You'd be able to find a couple of people who'd be interested in listening to AB for a couple of hours one night, you'd imagine. Well, the both and Graham Gooch. Graham Gooch. Well, there's two. Yeah. There's two. Why doesn't he go out with the both and Gucci? And the Gap. Mm. They'd all have a lot of things in common. Yeah, there's a lot of anger there, a lot of passion. They mm. could swear at each other and uh, and enjoy it. And uh, and the younger players could out and get out and about Warren style, yes. doing what they want to do. What do you make of this claim that Warren is now the sexiest man alive? Uh, you know, uh, obviously, you know they they look at him, they can oh. smell him, they've got him over there in their clutches, and it is a big rap though. Uh, can the boy deliver? I think he can. I, I, I think Shane is, has, has emerged as a very, very creditable, sexy young Australian man. Fit. He's very, very fit. Uh, he's not shy about uh, spreading himself about. Uh, I, I, I know he's, uh, he's uh, in the dressing rooms. He's, he's often walking around with just a cap on. 
and he often opens the dressing room door up just a little, you know, just opens a little crack there in the door and allows a bit of himself, not only his nose, to poke through. Now, I know the press and love it, love it, and a lot of people find that very, very alluring to see visitors, i.e. Australians, door open just a little bit and two bits of a fit player for, you know, poking through, mm. one being the nose mm. and one being a little bit out. Mm. I know it's very attractive and I know that Shane has been doing a lot of this sort of work and I think it's got to be good for Australian cricket. Uh, it's mm. a lot better than the captain. There's a lot better example than the captain. Oh, thing. yes, the, than the captain, you know, just, you know, grabbing him by the hair, pulling him back and saying, you know, bugger off you lot, mm. you know. I, I think that's embarrassing. You know, they don't want to see Captain Grumpy storming out. They'd rather see a fit young Australian with... Uh, Two points of interest. A lot of equipment. Pat Cash plays tennis. Pat Cash drinks milk. Pat Cash plays the acoustic guitar loudly. Pat Cash waters the lawn by hand. Pat Cash is a champion. Pat Cash, the slave and Nelson Green Machine. How would you like to be stout? Stumpy Boom wasn't born that way, so talk to him. Just ask Roy to tear it up. Hey, just going back to the Bashers tour for a moment, yeah, boys. Yeah. Hey, did you want to? Have no, a no. I was that? just going to say, but you know, Keith Miller said something many years ago that I've, I've kept with me for the rest of my life. Keith said that in a cricketer's life, there are two things that are private: what goes on on the paddock and what goes on in the bedroom. And I think that's absolutely right. And I think those people that uh, that are trying to, you know, pick up on store on conversations that are going on out in the field, I think it's an invasion of privacy. I think it's no different than people having tapes of A B in bed. Yeah. You know, well, I, we've got some good tapes. Well, we've got some bed. tremendous tapes. Yeah. yeah very funny. Yeah. Very funny yeah. And, and lively. Yeah. You know, no, lively. A lot of good ideas. And <clears throat> tremendous ideas, and and uh, a lot of very rich blue, what I call blue vein language. Cheesy, you mean. <laughs> uh, Roy, I think that the, the... I take your point entirely. It's not as though we come on air and we broadcast all this stuff that was collected by having the microphones near, underneath no, AB's bed. No. Even though we could. We could we get could. a very funny show out of that. Well, I've got a bag full of tapes here of AB in bed. But I'm not going to broadcast them. No. I'm not going to broadcast no. them. I'm going to give them back to AB... Next time I see him. Yeah, it's like people who want us to work blue. I mean, mm. we just won't do it. We'll I mean, there refuse. are, are, are some channels, mm. yeah, that's right, who would want us to come on their program, mm. but because they want us to work blue all the time, we've yes. just got to say no. Yes. Uh, you know, if if Channel 9 want to have blue on it there all the time, that doesn't bother me. No. I quite like it, to be quite honest. Yeah. But, on the other hand, I don't want to be part of it. No. I don't mind having it in my home. No. <laughs> But, on the other hand, being part of it as a disseminator of it or a promoter of no. it is an entirely different question. Yeah, that's right. Right. Not like Keith Miller. Who's working blue, I mean, born blue. That's what they call him. Keith Bluey Miller. Miller. Bluey Miller. He was always using language that would make your sailors blush. But it was different in those days. You could get away with it yeah. because you didn't have shotgun mics and yeah, you, no you, weren't under, you weren't under the public scrutiny that, yeah. that players are now or the pressure that players are. I mean, AB is under constant surveillance, you know, 24 hours a day. Mm. 24 hours a day. You know, mm. when he goes into his hotel room, if he's it's kept, bugged. It's bugged. He's yeah. got to go around and you know look behind the pictures to see where the, in the camera is and, and all that sort of stuff. Yeah. And he knows there are videos being made. AB's private life. You know, AB in bed. Uh, AB on the job. Mm. You know, stools from AB. Uh, I know. I know. For, you know, when it, one hotel he was staying at, the uh, the uh, underwater camera. Well, no, the plumbing was rerouted, so that whenever AB did commit himself to Brown. It would go to an area of the hotel where public could come and have a look at it, go through a, 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 a see-through Perspex pipe, pipe and uh, <clears throat> it was uh, you know, relayed onto plates where people could, in fact, poke around with it to, to look at it. And I think that's going too far. Uh. I think there are certain things that AB should be able to do without the public prime, without uh. the public being there. Leave AB alone. Roy. Let him get on with being what he is, an old cricketer. Yeah, an old dud cricketer has been in a fraud. Now, Roy, 
What I wanted to ask also is the British press. Let's face it, you and me have been to Britain many, many times. You've toured there, obviously played for Australia there. Mm. How intrusive can they be? I, I mean, as pointed out, you know, there's at least seven morning tabloids. Mm. What's the worst experiences you've had, especially representing Australia with the Rugby League? And can't there be some sort of gentle person's agreement with a touring side uh, that photos of stools on page three is not the done it's thing? It's not the done thing. You know, yeah. AB drops us in it. And then yeah. a picture of a big Stanley. Yes. I mean, it's not very edifying, is it? Well, no. I, 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 the Murdoch press, I think, has gone just a little bit too far in Great Britain, HG. You know, when, when you have scientists examining things and saying, you know, A, B, ate Chinese last night. I, I think it is. I think that has gone definitely too far. Uh, I remember one year touring uh, we were in Hull. And uh, in those days, the uh, it was what we call a three-quarter bed, not a single bed. And uh, both, you know, two players had to share the three-quarter bed. And uh, so we would sleep head to toe, head to toe. Uh, and I remember Stacky and I were sharing a room. This was Keith Stackpole. And Keith's a big bloke. And uh, I had, so I had my feet up on Keith's pillow and at one end of the bed. And uh, he had his feet up on my pillow on the other end of the bed. That's how we slept in those days. Mm. And uh, there was nothing weird about it uh, or unusual, uh, nothing suggestive. Uh, it was just a couple of blokes in a cold country in a three-quarter bed trying to keep warm. It was as simple as that. And uh, I, remember, I remember one night uh, <coughs> I uh, you know, <coughs> knew I'd, I'd tucked in with Keith and uh, there was no problem. You know, night out, Keith, night Roy. And... You know, <coughs> He snored like buggery, you know. So, but he, all you had to do was sort of whack him on the knee or tickle his feet or something like that, and he'd shut up. Uh, or he'd roll over, you know, hopefully roll over the right way. And uh, I, I remember one night, we were waking up at about six in the morning, and uh, it felt very odd, very odd indeed. And uh, I, I started tickling his feet. Uh, you know, often we do that if we wake up early, we, you know, we might get a nail and whack it into the bottom of the foot or something, just something for a bit of a gag. So you'd wake up with a smile on your face, you know. <laughs> <laughs> I started jabbing away, thinking it was Stacky's foot, <laughs> and uh, it was the press. Yeah. The press had come in in the middle of in the, the middle night. of the night, climbed into climbed bed, climbed into bed, bed got Stacky, yeah. wheeled him off somewhere. You know, he, he woke up, you know, twenty or thirty miles down down the way, but, but he slept like you know, he slept like you know, buggery. You couldn't, you'd never wake Keith up. So he was in the back of a truck, you know, on mile, his way to Taunton. <laughs> We've waited well to wherever, yeah. and uh, there I was with the press, and uh, you know I woke up tapping Blake's foot, and he had a microphone there, and was taking notes. Yeah. So you know I had to do the right thing. I, I uh, you know I apologised, etc. Before I hit him, and destroyed his equipment, and uh, sent him out. You know, uh, you know, Packing. in the right direction, sans clothes, uh, sans eyebrows, sans hair, and any area of the anatomy he was completely you know but i felt that i had a right to do that now you know the, the press beat it up the press went to town you know uh, australians unsavory australians unsavory health practices you know feet on pillows yeah roy does his block in roy hull. does his block in hull yeah. you know uh, stacky where's he gone yeah. mystery man disappears all these sorts of stories and i blame the press you know we were just come, and, and everyone was you know richie was sleeping you know you know what have you you know uh, richie often tucked in with simo i mean sure it didn't go on for too long uh simo had interesting habits that were um, incompatible with yes. richie <laughs> with richie and richie to, to, to give him his due he's a selfish sort of bugger if there was a three-quarter bed he wanted to himself yeah. and uh, if he did have to share a room with richie thankfully i never had to do so he slept on the floor yeah. you know richie was a, but he, he was captain he was at work most of the time, yeah. too. Upholding standards mm. and traditions and expectations. Mm. Mm. Yeah, but all I can say is that the players don't have to put up with the inconveniences that we had to do had to in those days. You know, often you'd have eight blokes in bed. You know, it's been known. Yeah. Eight blokes in bed. Yeah. And it's very hard to get sleep. You have different nocturnal habits. You know, if, if you're tucked in there and uh, say, you know, Stacky, Stacky's been eating, you know, a lot of pastry, mm. then... You get certain odours and aromas mm. that, uh, or if someone's been eating garlic, mm. not that anyone did in those days, oh, but if yeah. someone was to, yeah. you'd get the sort of. It was just uns It was just difficult, yeah. difficult. But it did galvanise the team, HG. I, I, I must say that you, you did feel you were part of a team when you lived and breathed and and slept 
and browned and steamed and all those things with your mates. Girls, you've loved their work on the paddock, but you can't get them to come across after the full-time siren sounds. Why not spend a three-night intensive with Roy and HG and guest lecturers Noel and Les Cleal and learn how the sports stars like it? This course is not available at TAFEs or universities and is simply called Crack Onto a Cricketer. Learn what to say and when to say it. Learn what faces to pull when it comes to your turn to talk and what to do with your lips while they rabbit on and on about past digs. Graduates from this course in previous years are now happily married to Merv Hughes, Stumpy Boone, Terry Alderman and David Hooks and we are pleased to announce the engagement of Shane Warne to one of our most recent graduates. Just look in the local paper for details. I'm glad I've solved one mystery. I've always known the Racker Welchers hated uh, Elizabeth Taylor's guts and vice versa. And mercifully, a new book has cleared all this up. Now, uh, Elizabeth Taylor Fotensky bears a jealous grudge against Racker Welch because she believes, that's Liz believes, the Racker had a passionate affair with Big Dicky Burton maybe he was it, uh, 21 years ago. The feud between the stars has long been the talk of Hollywood and Ruin myself and everybody connected with the uh, rugby league in Australia, not to mention the AFL, but few knew the reason until now. A source says the romance on the set of Bluebeard, 1972. Wasn't that a tremendous film, Bluebeard? Bluebeard, yes. It only lasted three days. Liz was on the set for the first day, according to a source. Then Rich's brother died and she flew to Britain for the funeral. She returned without Liz. He returned without Liz and started inviting Raquel to his trailer, that is caravan, every time there was a break in the filming. She was absolutely bedazzled. Roy, you know mm. both these big hitters of the Hollywood scene, and obviously you're quoted there, you didn't want to be revealed, but, you know, sources close to both, inside sources close, an insider, dot, dot, dot. I read Roy Slavin and all of those. What can you tell us about this feud, which mm. has really gone on? I mean, when you look at feuds... Mm. You know, there's obviously Gavin Miller's feud with Arco. That's pretty intense and, and that. But this would be bigger than that. Johnny Rebo's feud with Arco. Yeah, well, that's that's heat. There's heat there. Wally's and I, feud with, with Mark Johnny Guy. Rebo. And yeah. Wally's with Mark Guy. And Artie's feud with Wally when Wally was still paying. That was a beauty. Mm. And, of course, you've got Carl Langdon's feud with, uh, you know, with John Ron Walsh. Barassi. With Ron Barassi, which has been reignited this week. Mm. But how would you rate this as a feud amongst feuds you've known? Raquel and Elizabeth mm. hate each other's guts. I can't think of any way, any other way to put it. It's as plain as day. Uh, I mean, Dick Burton was the sort of bloke to spread himself very thinly. Mm. He was... He had so much to give. And Dick loved women. And women loved Dick. <laughs> Keep going, Roy. I can't see an end to this one yet. <laughs> Look, when I mean you, you put the three magic elements together: four, opportunity, yeah. a trailer, yeah. Raquel Welch, Dick Burton, five, a futon. Now Richard would have obviously just said something innocently like, "Would you like to have a look at my futon, Raquel?" And she would have said something equally as innocent. Oh, you got a food on, have you, Richard? What's yeah, it like where, for the where back? Is, where is it? Mm. In my trailer. Mm. Oh, I've never know, tried I'll, a food. Uh, yeah, I've never seen one. Um, you know, they were Jap, aren't they? Japanese, aren't they? And Richard would say, yeah, come and have a look. And it would have been absolutely innocent, HG. Mm. Absolutely innocent. Mm. Until you had those elements of Dick, Raquel and the, and the food on. In the, as I say, with the, with the opportunity, you know, no one else around. But uh, they would have walked into the trailer, door closed. It wasn't a very good door closing. No, it wasn't actually. Next, <laughs> ne <laughs> next thing, next thing you know, next thing you know, uh, Richard would have said, "Well, you know, it's a little bit firm, but see how, it should, you know, try it, sit on it." She would have sat on it, and she would have said, "It's not a bit small for two, though, is it, Dick?" And or you know Dicky, whatever she called him, Richard, and he would have sat down with her. Next thing, boom, one thing's leading to another. The trousers are against the right. wall, and bits yes. and pieces everywhere. Oh. She began calling him Bert. Yeah, uh, for a long time. Mm. Bert, well, in obviously. the dark, he represent. He was just felt exactly like Bert Newton, didn't he? Well, and she knew because she in the touch test. Yeah, if, I don't know whether you ever did, but if you ever get Bert Newton in the dark and touch him. Honestly, it's Richard Burton. Yeah, especially when the belt unbuckled. Oh, well, you that's know, what I meant. It yeah. took that as red that it buffed. You know, I'm only talking from the waist down. Yeah. You know, from the waist up, obviously, tactilely, nothing the same. But around that area, mm. 
just go the gra- go the grab on Bert Newton and honestly, Richard Burton, right to the T. Hello everyone, Paul Murphy here and I'm sick of people bumping into me saying love your show so I get away from them by phoning up Ian Sinclair and shouting Hey Sinkers, what have you got on? Nothing much? Well then, let's go to Nude for the long weekend. Australian Consumers Association and Choice Magazine have declared the Totally Ian Roberts Bar too hard. Stiff. Totally Ian Roberts Bars are now harder than ever. Taylor, Liz, Taylor, Peter, Taylor, Brian, Taylor, Mark, Collins, Joan, Collins, Bill, Collins, Books, Collins, Jackie, Paparazzi, Glitterati, Literati. As the sun sets and the bet settled, this sporting life presents Hollywood Nights. Roy and HG's weekly sojourn into the dressing rooms and changing rooms of the world of entertainment. And now, the man with the mic, in the spotlight, centre stage, HG Nelson. Uh, yes, thanks very much, King. Uh, look, uh, Roy, uh, Peter McAvoy's been in touch with me from the middle of Australia, and he said uh, he uh, found an item uh, concerning a, a scandalous moment in, in our cultural history in the Adelaide Advertiser uh, of a couple of weeks or ten days or so ago, mm. and it concerns a lot of flute work that uh, an artist called uh, Cynthia Alberton mm. uh, had done some years ago. She had made an impressions, obviously, of the flutes of uh, people like uh, Jimi Hendrix, Zal Yanovsky of The Loving Spoonful, mm. of Eddie Brigatti of The Young Rascals, mm. and she told the court that uh, she used the plaster casts as... Uh, uh, moulds for bronze casts yeah. and uh Alberton had uh, sued the music publisher Herb Cohen, who had possession of the cast since 1971. This was of the flutes, remember, uh, for $1 million US or about $4.7 billion Australian. Yeah. Uh, now, money her lawyer, Geoffrey Glass, argued she could have made by displaying them. Mm. Jimi Hendrix's flute went for approximately half a million at auction recently. <laughs> That's a cast of the flute, not the real flute, no. which has obviously gone with the worm some time ago. Yeah. Uh, Mr Glass told reporters earlier the one-of-the-kind replica of his, what he described as a muted trumpet, mm. must be worth at least that much. The judges also returned, ordered Cohen to return all the casts. Now, this is a breakthrough for art, I think. And why haven't the mm. Sydney bid thought of this? The Sydney Olympic bid thought of flute casts to go with that rather right, right. tawdry list of pictures I read out mm. some three hours ago here on the Mullet Network, Triple J. Mm. What, flute casts of... of prominent Australian. Prominent Australian uh, sports people? Or? Well, sports people, politicians, uh, artists, you know, business identities. I mean, I'm sure they'd love to see a, a, get a glimpse of, say, Alan Bond's flute mm. in cast. Uh, you know, Nobby, Clark. Nobby, Nobby Clark. Nobby Clark, yes. I'd love to see some of the Clark boys who have done so much good in the Pyramid and the State Bank of South Australia. So much good work have well, come the from board, the Clark. The board of Westpac. Well, indeed, in or the old days. Flutes in position. In, in the you board. Know, in the pecking order. So there'd be the chairman, I use that term advisedly, up the top. Yeah. It'd be a beautiful display. Well, and uh, flutes... In a boardroom setting. Yeah. It could be a 3D piece. A sort of sculpture, wouldn't it be? of the boardroom. You could probably actually buy the table, the the original boardroom table there at Westpac. They'd sell you that if they knew it was going towards the Sydney bid. And all the seats. With just and a flute on each. you have the flute on each seat yeah. in the position it was in when those great decisions were made yeah. in the 80s. Yeah, and which buildings to buy and so on. Well, well I, think I think that's great bit. news. Oh, that is Look, th- what saddens me here is why... Who stopped... Who embargoed the, the flute casts? The Herb Cohen, the, the uh, you know, she... Uh, music publisher? But music what's publisher. music publisher got to do with flute? Well, <clears throat> he's had possession of the cast since 1971. In other words, obviously, yeah. the artist uh, Cynthia Alberton... But she, has she got the positives or what? Well, I don't think the Plaster of Paris has worn that well over the 20 years. But, but on, on the other hand, hang, on, hang, hang on. on, on the other hand, I think he might have the, the positives have gone, Roy. Well, who's got the positives? The people who had them originally. No, 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 but she would have She made had the cast, plaster cast. But she would have made very... She, as soon as it, the plaster dried, you'd imagine she would have... Would have been uh, pouring in the bronze yeah. and the gold. Mm. Well, I don't know why she didn't do that. I don't, you know, I can't answer that question. Well, that's a mystery, isn't it? Because the plaster doesn't take Maybe that's what the dry. Mel and the boys were helping with the, uh, the WA. Police inquiries. And WA. <laughs> it's a long bow, but <laughs> the legal mind is a funny one. But I think this is this, this. Could the flutes be the, the icing on the cake that Beijing hasn't thought of? Well, I'm sure no one... I'm sure Deng. I mean, Deng's got every base covered, but I'm sure he hasn't thought of flutes. But I, how many uh, flutes are there in Australia? Well, a census showed the other day, I think there were about 7... 
1.2 million flutes in Australia. Don't tell me that wouldn't shock the, uh, the exhibitors if we sent a cast of every one. And Not also, the cast, you know, the positive. Yeah. yeah. The positive. Yeah. yeah no, it wouldn't, wouldn't cost that much. But, no. I mean, it would be up to each individual. To register well, to, get to, buy, to buy the plaster. And then just mail off. mould yourself. And do, a, say, a simple wax. No, just plaster. Positive. Yeah, yeah that'd be c- the... Cover it with, with Vaseline so it doesn't hurt in getting, when, you get the, when the plaster's dried and you've got to remove it. Uh, so you might be able to get some sort of governmental compensation for the on Medicare. On Medicare. Yeah. You buy a plaster bandage, yeah, wrap it free. around, and in different states of arousal, I think might be interesting as well. Well, three... Like... like uh, three different versions. Mm. <laughs> sort of obviously prepared for the high C at one end and then and out of tune. Out of tune. <laughs> <laughs> the other. But <laughs> what I've got confused so is... So you'd have 7 million times 3, 21 million yeah. odd, and say 22 million flutes, Switzerland bound. Qantas, you'd need three or four planes. Yes. Think of the publicity. Uh, well, as each, as each state contributed, mm. and there'd be pictures of uh, newsreaders or prominent people in the community, you know, obviously on the job with the plaster, yeah. getting the trombone into the high seat position. everyone to do it, the Prime Minister. Yeah. That's right, would have to do, do it. it for, do it for the, Sydney. The Flying Fists of Fury, Dr John mm. Hewson would have to do it, and so on. Rocket Reith would have to do it. Mm. Mm. I'd love to see Rocket work with some plaster. Yeah. Well, <laughs> I, look, I, I think it could be, A, funny... Bound to be funny, Roy. <laughs> engaging. B, engaging. C, yeah. provocative. Yeah. D, unusual. And C, Olympic bid winning. Of course it would. That, that would be the, you know, the, that would be the, the final... But hang on a minute. Listen, what are we sending? What are we sending? We, we Obviously, everybody has to take the now, three states. you don't send states. the plaster cast. No. We send the, we send the positives. Yes, right. What do they call the plaster cast? That's a negative. Yeah. And then into that, what are we going to pour? Just uh, paraffin wax. Yeah, well, that's a good point. I, I think... Oh, hang on. How would what? you do... Now, now hang on. Hang on. You'd, you'd have to make, have the mould in two halves. Right, so you take the plaster <coughs> off. Then join it back together. Ah, uh, no. In some pour cases... pour in. When you're on the well, high... With the pla- you get the plaster and then you put some sort of detergent or what have you in it. Or maybe some sort of Vaseline or what have you. So that it will smoothly be removed from whatever you make the positive. Yeah, but in the high C position, mm. you know, it's obviously there's an easy way out of that, is that after the uh, after the high C position cast has been made, mm. you reduce it to the out of tune position, mm. and Bob's your uncle, it comes off easy. Oh yeah, that's not a problem. <laughs> yeah, no, no, no but, but what I meant was not a problem. No, what what I meant was well, what, what do you, do you put, put in, in to make it positive? Yeah, where, where you could. Go oh, I see what you mean. You have bronze. to reline it with yeah, something. Yeah, reline it. Yeah, and then it's okay. So you go with either bronze. Gee, you can make it cheap. Just Twenty-one million bronze flutes. <laughs> The exhibition, yeah, and just well, imagine take up a bit of space, sure. And just imagine the thrill of unpacking them, you know, over there when the yeah. well, you know obviously Juan Antonio does all this work himself. Mm. Mm. But I wonder if the well, it looked a little bit like the Vatican, you know, when they bumped off all the flutes from the statues. Ah, right, they got drawers yeah. full of them. <laughs> it looks very, looks very attractive. Right. Or maybe you could bludge those as well. That's right. Pump up the bid a little bit, so you'd have twenty three million, twenty three million flutes, most of which are Australian. <laughs> Yeah. Don't tell me that's not remarkable. Roy of HG Circus World is proud to present, direct from a sellout season at the Adelaide Arts Festival and the triumphant tour of Europe, the big man of circus, Jeff Kennett and his trained mice. Stand back when Jeff lets the mice loose from his trousers. Be amazed when Jeff sets fire to a thousand adorable rodents before your very eyes and gasp as Jeff buries the lot of them with a Massey Ferguson tractor. That's the big man and his mice, Jeff Kennett, now playing Circus World Ballarat, who said the fringe couldn't become mainstream. And I stress again that none of the mice are hurt in anything that Jeff does to them. Uh, I must point out also that uh, a couple of people have been on the phone already saying, uh, you know, uh, had I cited or had Roy cited or had King Wally Otto cited the uh, Jimi Hendrix sloop that uh, Cynthia Albritton had made the plaster cast of. Well, uh, unfortunately, 
I had misread the article, the original article. I should point out that Jimmy's sloop hasn't been on sale anywhere. In fact, Jimmy, it was a guitar. It was Jimi Hendrix's guitar that went on sale for $500,000, approximately $7.6 billion Australian. And, uh, well, a plaster the, impression? or the No, the thing? actual guitar. Although a plaster impression mm. would be a fantastic idea, mm. uh, especially if you got the sloop to go with it. Now, Jimi Hendrix's guitar went on sale for the $500,000 US, and the one-of-a-kind replica of his trouser trumpet, must be worth at least as much, according to the lawyers. That was the actual, uh, that, that was how they established a the value on the sloop work that uh, Cynthia had done all those years ago. Yeah, I'm trying to think who, uh, there's quite a famous sloop in history that was severed prior or just after death and uh, hung around for a couple of hundred years, wasn't there? Just trying to think whose it was. Well, let's see now, who died 200 <laughs> years ago? <laughs> Can't have been many people around <laughs> compared with now. No. Was it I immediately thought of Errol Flynn. No. Uh, did, did, um, no, it wasn't that long ago. I'm trying to try, it'll come to me. Yeah. There was quite a famous case. Yes. yes. It was hand, <clears throat> handed round amongst the crowned heads of Europe there for a while. It was kept in a box. After the dinner conversation, you know, eagerly anticipated. <laughs> Have you seen? <laughs> yeah, that's right. After the meal, as that's seen right. by the boys the other night, that's right. down at uh, the Parliament House. Yes. Now, the Mad was, Monk. The Mad Monk. It was the Mad Monk sloop. Rasputin. Rasputin sloop. They went on a I'm tour of the sure crown heads of Europe. I'm pretty sure it was Rasputin's sloop. There was pastor. I mean, you still might be able to see it in Vienna or wherever. <laughs> Vienna world? In Goldman? <laughs> well, well, it might be there. It... it uh, at the, you had at the to big knock three times <laughs> and ask for Joe. And then you got to have a for. clove of garlic and a wooden stick. And <laughs> that's, that's, right, that's right. That's right. That's right. Yeah, so go in steadily and walk in backwards. <laughs> Sighting things in a mirror. <laughs> That's how to view these things. Mm. But what I'd like to point out, though, uh, is look at the com look at the conversation we've had today. Uh, you know, just on the fact of two yeah. mute tr mute trumpets, yeah. the trouser trumpets. Uh, you know, we've only got two. Imagine. Mm. The talk, the 7.2 million. Oh, the 20, 22 million. The 22 million, sorry, the three you, versions. You of the three versions. Yeah, C, D. C flat. <laughs> Out of tune. D. I <laughs> down. Now. You know, do you know I mean? Just imagine the talk around the world. But when can you imagine lined up, like spread into the crack of doom, like like one, in a, one single line? They 22 million in tools. Switzerland would go from one extreme, you know, from the border in Italy. To the border in France, yeah. it, right across the length of the country, yeah. Australian tools yeah. at work for the Olympic bid. For the Olympic bid, I think that's a compelling image that Christo would have trouble. Well, I was thinking of Christo too as soon yeah. as I, and then when he came I mean, to wrap Christo it up, Christo only, I mean, plastic. Who cares? But dudes on the job for the Olympic bid. The Olympic bid. That is a talking point. It is. You know, I know we've won the bid, but that'd be the icing on the cake, wouldn't it? Yeah. Well, I, I think we should do it anyway, even if we lose the bid. Uh, no, if we lose the bid, we send back doors. <laughs> Well, there it is, ladies and gentlemen, Tool Talk and Wisecracks from Roy Slaven and H.G. Nelson. I hope you liked it. I know I found it very informative, and I had no idea you could do that with a hairdryer, a date and a packet of rinser. If you like Roy and H.G.'s work, why not pick up a copy of Pound for Pound, the cassette which sets out the panel's thoughts on several burning issues confronting this great Asian nation of ours. I'll get out of your way now and leave you to fiddle in peace with the simple reminder that wet or dry, it's worth a try. Bye now.